Hello, everyone, uh, to this course, which will take four days. Um, my name is Tar Mostolo. I'm, uh, I'm from Reykjavik University. I also have an affiliation in uh, Tallinn University of Technology. And indeed, this is a course on, um, on monads and uh, interaction. Um, um, so um, I think there will be some overlaps uh, with other courses, but um, usually this is never a bad thing. You get different perspectives. Um, this course is going to be a mix. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be quite theoretical. On the other hand, I provide Haskell code for most things I do. And you're welcome to write more Haskell code. Um, um, you can, you're also welcome to write Agda if you want to prove things. These would be the two languages I, I like to work with um, and limit myself to, if possible, to, uh, to keep the complexity down. So what is this about? Um, <clears throat> Uh, the course is about functional computation with effects, um, or what also people call impure functional computation. Uh, um, and um, I'm sure this has already come up, and I, I heard part of uh, uh, part of the previous lecture. So this is about functions uh, that. Question is being recorded. Just to make sure. Is it being recorded? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, yes. Recording because it was. Oh, sorry. We are now recording again. Yeah. Okay, the, the course is about functional computation with effects, um, which are um, uh, also talked about as impure functional computation. And this is about functions that are there not only to return values, which ordinary functions uh, have as their mission, but they do other things along the way, so to say, uh, from acquiring their input to producing the uh, return values for someone else to collect. So the way you can think about it is um, these kind of computations, they talk to the environment, or people also call it the world. And in some, pa some papers, it's, it's funnily called the central authority. So the world is a central authority. And examples of such effects, um, as you may well know, are things like exceptions or non-deterministic choice, or input-output through some peripherals, or manipulation of, um, of, uh, of external store. Uh, none of these are purely functional in the sense like, uh, you know, a function produces a single value. Non uh, non yeah, the, the idea of non-deterministic choice is somehow that uh, a function should have the possibility of having multiple outcomes. So from where can this possibly come? Well, somebody makes a choice, the function in some sense branches, and at the end, of the different computation paths that you get in this way, there are different return values from the function. But uh, we'll talk closer about this. But this is some of the idea. So there is a classic approach to, um, to, um, to, uh, to mathematical programming semantics for effects, which is based on monads. It was imported to, to functional programming practice by Philip Wadler. And it has been refined by Plotkin and Power, which is this view of finitary monads as algebraic theories. Uh, the two are really the same thing, but somehow the emphasis are different. Um, and there are some advantages to, uh, to, to this uh, algebraic theories approach. Effectful computations. So imagine a, a function manipulating memory. Uh, if you view it like this, that the function manipulating memory uses an external memory service, um, like, I don't know, a notepad somewhere, uh, or <laughs> write something on the sand, uh, then, uh, then this service has to interact with the program in some way, right? You, you, the, the, the program or the computation makes a write request, and the environment must somehow respond, probably by remembering what was written and sort of taking care of it for the future. The program can also make read requests, and then, uh, then the environment, the world, is supposed to come with, with an answer that meets the kind of normal contract for, for, for memory or store, namely it should come back with the value that you, that you uh, data value that you last wrote. 
computation. So to run these effectful computations, they basically need to throw the people and if the environment is present, it's a information waiting. Something from the reason they are stuck. So um, I have the view that uh, effectful functions, when you try to run them, they are helpless alone without an environment they're embedded in and without the communication protocol with it. So interaction is really about thinking not only about these effectful computations. Uh, which programs represent, but sort of the underlying machinery on which those should be executed that I want to abstract into something I call environments and how the two can communicate. Uh, and interaction is, is, is in particular about these communication protocols. But today I will actually start, make a start on monads. Environments actually are modeled with co-monads and um, I'll get to them either uh, in the second half tomorrow, or then in the third part. And then in the second half of the third part or the fourth part, I will properly talk about interaction. So I'll, I'll tell you some, you know, some central theory about monads on one hand as, no, as models of notions of computation, co-monads on the other hand as uh, models of notion of, on, of environment, and then interaction laws which is a framework of, of gluing the two together and talk about how an effectful program runs with the help of an environment. Is this good? Um, there are complaints about the quality of the audio. Was it, was it temporary or is it happening all the time? Uh, In, intermittent. Yeah. It's okay now. Can you repeat? Yeah. Intermittent. Intermittently, there was poor audio. There was breaking and uh, of the of the sound. Uh, intermittent. It's okay now, at least. Okay, that's that's a bit sad. Let's let, let's try to continue. If it goes completely wrong, then uh, I will have to. Well, then we have to stop and restart somehow. But I hope it's good. Um, so um, this is the course. Um, so prerequisites, I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure what level you will find this course is. Maybe it's intermediate. So what, what is kind of necessary? Yeah, it broke again. Is it worth if everyone turns off their video? There's also something bad with my Zoom process. It shows that it's taking a lot of memory and I don't understand for what reason. So there's something strange that the Zoom client is doing on my end. Uh, I'll carry on a bit, but if it continues like this, I think it wor it's worth of making a three minute break and me restarting. Okay. So uh, these, these bits should be necessary. You should know what a category is, what a functor is, what a natural transformation is. It's good to know products, co-products, and function spaces, and a bit of inductive and co-inductive types, although I won't go there deeply. Uh, I will present a lot of examples. It's very example-based, and the examples, actually, they all work in the category of sets. You can also think just as but almost all are more general that they also make them work uh, in You're uh, breaking up again? Here's the little wall. Clock, clock. Karma? Yes. Yeah, so you're breaking up again. I, so so I suppose it's best if I restart completely. It might be best to restart completely. When you come back, um, we can have you maybe record locally. Um, the video quality might be better on your own machine, or audio quality rather. Um, well, let's see. I'll be back in three minutes. Is it okay? Um, 
Yeah, let's uh, take a three and minute break. I'm afraid you have to stop right now. I think it's probably worth it uh, rather than suffering forever. Uh, yeah. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Okay, so I'm announcing a pinkle pause for three minutes. Yeah, until 55. Um, I'm, I'll be back. Hello, how is it now? Um, Good for now. Um, for the moment, okay. Yeah, so if you could also record the video on your own machine. One sec, I have to give you the privileges back. I'm not co-host, so I can't share. Yeah. Uh, here we go. So your co-host now. And you want me to record locally. I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but. Um... Um, what I was thinking is that the recording that we're making probably has all those glitches in it, but if you record it locally, it might be fine. So will you record as well then? No? Yeah. 
I think we can do both, right? Um, I don't actually know that we can do both. <laughs> <laughs> but when I say power stop, pause stop recording, it says, do you want to stop cloud recording? I think I'm just stopping your recording rather than starting yeah. my own. Yeah. yeah, it may be true that we can only do it one way. And this yeah. is what I get here. So it's recorded now, you say? Huh? It is currently recording, yeah, on the cloud. Okay. I'm very so, sorry for this. This is always extremely annoying. Yeah. I think we'll just record the, the usual way then for now, since we can't do both. Okay, um, so here's some pictures without words. Um, uh, we're talking about functional computation. Uh, very often we can think of, of uh, functional computation just in terms of how we plug functions together as, 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 uh, as proponents of strongly typed functional prog uh, programming, we know that very often types tell us a lot. So, so let me give you some pictures explaining what the issues are around control flow and, and effects. So when we, when we program with normal functions, then everybody knows that I can take a function from Z to Y, Y to X, and I can plug them together. This is function composition. And of course, you can have longer chains of functions, pure functions, and compose them together. Composition is associative. It doesn't really matter which order you bracket things. And it's also clear that we can do little other forms of control flow purely functionally, like, for example, conditionals. So if there is two ways of getting from Y to X, then of course I can get from the choice of y and another y to x. Um, on the other hand, if, uh, if from a y I can produce a Boolean, if I know, uh, you know, if I can go to either of unit and unit, which is Boolean, um, then uh, this can be transformed into a, a function that takes uh, y to y plus y, uh, basically identity uh, in each case is depending on the Boolean, then, then I can compose two functions together this one deals with a, with a choice of a branch in a conditional. This one is actually a, a combination of both branches of the conditional. And I've made a function from y to x from three little functions, one from y to Boolean and two functions from y to x. Uh, conditionals, they are not about effects. This is all sort of standard manipulation of just mathematical functions. But what is effects? Effects are maybe exceptions Suppose uh, we are working with functions from Z to Y, but they are exceptional in the sense that every now and then they don't return Y, but they return something from E, where E we can think of as a type or a set of exceptions. If I then have a similar function from Y to X, which is not a pure function, but an exceptional function, then it goes officially from Y to E plus X. And if I then want to compose these two together, I have the problem that the types in the middle don't match, right? But if I was somehow able to fix the two types, morally I had a function from Z to Y, although with a possibility of exceptions, another one from Y to X, although morally with a possibility of exceptions, I'd expect that I do get the function from Z to X with a possibility of exceptions. Isn't it? Right. Um, similar things could happen with other forms of effect. Suppose I've got these multiple valued functions I work with a function that produces from Z's Y's, but not a single Y for a given Z, but possibly a list of Y's that signifies, you know, um, a set or multi-set of outcomes ordered in a list. So this is about non-determinism. If I then have another function similar that from single Y's produces multiple X's, I, I would like to compose them together. But again, there is this mismatch that in the middle, the first function gives me multiple outcomes. The second function for every single input can produce multiple outcomes. How do I then from a single Z produce multiple X's? And there is a way to glue these things together. And that has something to do with effects as modeled by monads. There is more to effects. Sometimes you do something different. You have these two functions like before, two non-deterministic or multi-valued functions that take single values to multiple values. I'd like to compose them together, but at the end of the day, I don't want multiple outcomes. I perhaps want some sort of an aggregate. Like maybe if X is, is 
it's some numerical type, maybe integers, maybe I'd actually be interested in the, in the maximum, for example. Uh, and that is yet a different way of, of, of dealing with facts because I'm working with non-determinism, but at the end of the day, I somehow want to be deterministic, right? So here is another interesting scenario that also arises with effects. I want to compose together functions that work with different notion of effect. Here's an impure function from Z to Y, which actually now and then might produce an exception, an element of E instead of an element of Y. Here's a function from Y to X, but it's again, not a pure mathematical function, but one that returns lists over X. So, here the effect is exceptions. Here the effect is non-determinism. Yeah, what can I, how can I possibly compose them? Maybe I should work in a bigger notion of effect that involves both non-determinism and exceptions. So here, for example, is, is one possible uh, uh, return type for the, for the composition of the two that I might to work with, that, that I might want to work with, sorry. So how is this dealt with? This is dealt with, with monads. Monads handle sequential composition like here. And then there are other things like effect handlers and, and monad compositions that are also important. So to combine together two functions like this from Z to Y, that can also raise an exception from Y to X that can also raise an exception. Maybe I could do the following. I should somehow promote the function that takes y's to x's exceptionally into a function that can also consume an exception on the input side and then produce an exception or an x. Because if I manage to promote this guy into a function of this type, then I just can compose the two functions in the ordinary way. And that is actually the notion of function composition, the, a notion of impure function composition that monads give you that we'll get to uh, in, in quite some detail. There is multiple ways of talking about it. This operation of promoting this guy to this is called bind in monads, but you can also work differently. Every monad is a functor. You could say from a function like this, I can manufacture a function like this, and then I can further compose that guy with a special function um, that somehow flattens down compositions of effects into a single effect, if you wish. We'll get to this. So it's, it's multiple ways of talking about this thing, but, but the important thing is monads provide you the glue. Exceptions uh, are a monad, lists are a monad, and we can do that. Uh, I had this other example where I said, maybe I'm interested in an aggregate at the end of the day, like the maximum, or maybe if it's a list of Booleans, I just want to know if, if among the Booleans there was falsity, for example. Then again, there is a systematic mechanism, which in this case says, I can compose uh, a function like this and the function like this together using the composition mechanism, sequential composition mechanism, what the, uh, as a monad gives me, and I get something like this. I'm here, but the result is still a list of x's, not a single x. Then if I happen to have um, um. Uh, if, if x happens to, 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 to be a set with a monoid structure, then actually um, I will have a function from list of x to x in a standard way, and I can comp compose this guy with this, and I do get the function from z to x. And this is related to handlers. I'm just hand waving here, but I, I want to give you the picture that the talk about uh, effectful computations and monads is very much about monads giving you the glue to, uh, to deal with a control around, uh, uh, around effectful computations, which are sequencing of effectful functions and then little other things of various sorts. Uh, then I'd like to get to my subject matter, but the bad thing is I don't see the chat at the moment. I want uh, to make it. Every one of your, well, essentially the modest columns are uh, function composition. So if I notice, if you, if you just go back to the previous slide, it looks like every time you, you, you know, bring two, two pieces of information together to, into one, like Z going to list of X and then list of X going to X gives you Z going to X. So that's mm -hmm. always a function composition, right? Everywhere of your, every one of your. 
Yeah, exactly. In, in the end, you really want to reduce the impurity of side effects to actually purity of, 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 of functions, right? right? So everything at the end of the day reduces to composition of ordinary functions, right. but there is still right. some glue needed here and there, right? Uh, let me make the chat visible for myself and let me share again. Uh, there is lots of comments about what things stand for. All of these things were for intuition and I'm going to introduce everything. So you don't have to worry about flatten, join and everything. For the moment, it's, it's all going to come. But thanks for starting to ask these questions. Um, you can see me again, right? Um, so I now want to give you some definitions on the mathematical level. I'll also show you some Haskell to, to explain how, uh, how, this, how this machinery works. And we're going to be pretty slow at the beginning. I'll speed up later, but it's, I think it's important that everyone is on the same page for the course. What I've said for now is there are these things called effects, which are about phenomena around functions that are non-purely functional. We actually want to reduce them to pure functionality. Uh, and, and this is then done with the help of sort of making explicit the type of glue that we need to, um, to, 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 to sort of combine impure functions together. <clears throat> Does anyone know how to disable Zoom's feature of going full screen when someone starts sharing? No one knows this. And that's the most annoying thing about Zoom. <laughs> Indeed, that was a question in the chat. Okay. I'll tell you, I'll show you some category theory. Don't be frightened because I want to give, for, for every slide on category theory, there is going to be a slide next to it that gives you the vocabulary and the intuitions of things. So bear with me. I'll give you examples, formal definitions, and intuition. Um, a monad on a category is what? It's, um, it's what it says on some evil t-shirts on the back. <laughs> it's just the functor and two natural transformations, but let me walk through you through it. It is a functor. So think C is set. That is always a good um, a starting point. So your objects are sets and your maps are functions and there is nothing else in the category. A functor is something then that sends objects to objects and maps to maps, here sets to sets and functions to functions. In the sense of Haskell, it sends types to types. So it's a type constructor above all. A monad is a type constructor. And then there are natural transformations. Natural transformations are families of functions that, wor that work uniformly across all types. Um, there is a natural transformation eta from identity to T, which actually means that you've got a map from x to t of x for every x. And you see these things uh, here on the picture. This is eta at t of x, which actually goes from t of x to t of t of x. So it's an instantiation of this polymorphic function at t of x. Um, and there is a natural transformation for from t after t to t called the multiplication. And these satisfy some conditions. Um, now this may look, uh, depending on your background, it may look very easy for you or it may look like uh, Greek or Chinese for you, um, depending on which continent you come from. Let me give you some intuition. Um, so um, this, The C are types and functions. Now we think of computations as processes that can do various things, basically talk to the environment to get help, and that may eventually finish and return a value. Like if you've got a non-deterministic computation, the way it talks to the environment, it basically asks the uh, environment to cast a die uh, for the computation. Like, does it come up with heads, uh, heads or tails? And uh, and then it may repeatedly ask uh, the environment, like an oracle, where should I go in my non-deterministic choice? So you give up responsibility, the environment makes choices for you, that's your model of non-determinism, but eventually you hope to finish and return a value. So that's what computations are. Then a monad, which was a triple of a functor and two natural transformations is a particular notion of computation. 
So it, it, it models, for example, effects, or it models, for example, non-determinism, or it models, for example, state. Then how you should read these things, then that were here on this picture, these X's and T's and combinations of those. Always think, that's always my vocabulary. A schematic variable X is, it, it, it varies over any possible set, but it's always the set of values of some type that you keep in mind. So return values of interest for your functions. Now, t of x is another set, because I told you t is a functor, so it takes sets to sets. So if x is a set, tx is another set. And here, this set collects computations of values of type x. So its elements are not single values, but they are some sort of abstraction of these processes. Often you picture these processes as trees, but we are not yet there. So think t of x is, is, is a data type of computations over values. A simple example is if X is values of interest, then E plus X could be T of X and it would be your computations of values of type X. Actually, that example is on the next slide. But then there is more complicated things. On the picture, you see T of T of X and even T of T of T of X, what are those? These are computations that at the end, don't return a value of simpliciter, but return another computation of some value. So they are computations of computations of values of type X. That's what these things are. Um, someone asked, is T an endofunctor? Yes, because it maps uh, sets to sets. That's what we said here. It has to go from C back to the same category C. And a useful example to think of is C is set. Or think C is the category of Haskell types and the functions between them. I want to give you the intuition for eta and mu because this is important for the whole of the course. I mean, this slide is the most important one maybe for today. Eta is a gadget that takes a value and says it's a trivial impure computation just returning this value. Like in the case of exceptions, uh, it is just the realization that the given element of type X it's not an exception. It is something we want to return. Uh, so it's a purely formalistic thing. Uh, in Haskell, it's called return. Um, it's the concept of monad in linear algebra and instance of the categorical term. Um, I don't know the notion of, of monad in linear algebra, but if it's used in a linear algebra text, it is probably an instance of the categorical term, yes. Uh, um, um, mu is important. So this is a polymorphic function. For every set or think type X, it is a function from T of T of X to T of X. So this is a function that takes a computation of computations and turns it into a computation simpliciter. Morally, you should think it was a sequence. Now you see it just as one computation. And uh, examples will come, but let me then motivate what these laws say. <laughs> um, this one here says, I've got a computation over X and I just want to see trivially as a computation of computations. So um, the outer computation here does nothing. It just immediately returns the inner computation. And then mu is applied. This is the guy that sequences two computations together. The first one that does nothing and the inner one that does the real thing, whatever this given thing was here. And we flatten it down into just a computation. And the law says going this way is the same as doing nothing. I mean, just staying where you were. Uh, your etas and mu's are acting from the right, is it? Uh, unlike a normal function composition, just to make sure. Everything is acting the same way as in normal functional uh, composition in, in functional notation. Uh, so this is just eta at, at type tx. Eta is a polymorphic function. This is just one instance of it. It's the instance of eta at tx. Uh, but what about mu is the instance of mu at x. And this is function composition, yes. Uh, no, but what about t eta x, which is the, or the top line? The top line of t eta x. Oh, yeah. I haven't commented that yet. You're ahead of me. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so this is another. Um, this is another um, condition which says going this, this gives this. But let me read it out. So what does this t here mean? Uh, t here applied to x. 
I mean, a functor is two things, and you use the same notation for both. It takes objects to objects, so x is sent to tx. So a set is transformed into another set, but also it takes maps to maps. So eta x is a map from x to tx, but then t of eta x is something that applies uh, or, or sort of lifts this polymorphic function, uh, lifts the function, sorry, so that it doesn't go from x to tx, but it now goes from t of x to t of tx. Or in general, it would go from, now I should have taken my pad next to me, but in general, if you apply t to f, so if f goes from x to y, then t of f um, goes from tx to t of y. And actually in Haskell, you would call it f map. So this t here is nothing than f map of Haskell. Now, what is intuitively happening is you've got a computation and you say, at the end, I don't want to return a value. At the end, I want to return a trivial computation giving that value. So thereby, I've turned my computation into a, into, into a computation of computations. If I sequence them together, I get a single computation, and it's the original one. So here, I basically prepended some computation with doing nothing, and the effect after sequencing is the same as what I had. Here, I've appended doing nothing to a computation, and this has no effect. Here you have a computation of computations of computations of x. So it's a layer thing. And you should think there is some process that returns at the end another process, which when you run returns another process, which when you run at the end gives you x. Uh, there is two ways that you could flatten it into a simpler thing, into a computation of computation, either flattening uh, the two first guys the first and the second into this t here, that's mu of tx, or flattening the middle and the inner guy here, that's t of mu x. And then you could further apply sequencing and both of them just become tx, this and this. And this is the composition. Maybe I should show you the example and then show you the Haskell. So here is, the first important example that I will do in all cases. <clears throat> in the definition, the eta of x subscripts of t is the binary operation here. Now. Which order do I answer these questions? Um, the dot here is nothing else than composition of functors. So um, t dot t. Uh, check in the chat, apply to x is just the same as t of t of x. Okay. Um, eta and x subscripts of t, where is that? It's not the case here. t is applied to eta x. x is a subscript to eta, but t and eta are in the same line. Uh, um, is in the definition of monoidal category. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, this was just a comment I, I didn't really want to go into at all. <laughs> but there is a story which says that you can more abstractly uh, condense this definition into a statement that monads are monoids in the monoid category of functors. Um, um, but I will not tell you what the monoid category is here. I will not tell you how uh, what, what the definition of a general monoid in a monoid category is. So better maybe leave it for the tutorial or something if you want to ask, or I'm very happy to ask. To, to answer uh, offline uh, here. Uh, okay, exception monads. <laughs> Suppose you have coproducts, or in the terms in terms of Haskell, you've got um, either types. Yeah. Then we could define computations that are supposed to return values in type X as elements in this coproduct uh, or disjoint union, if you prefer the word E plus X. So that's the set that contains both elements of E and elements of X. And the idea is a computation is really a choice of either um, ending up in an exception, an element of E, or ending with a value in X. Now I have to define you uh, two um, polymorphic functions about these computations. One that takes a value and it turns into a trivial computation, which morally is just this value, but sort of under a bureaucratic um, view. <laughs> and mu, which is the other 
polymorphic function. The first one was called the unit. This is called multiplication. It's the one that takes a computation of computations for any value type x. So here it goes from e plus e plus x has to go down to e plus x. So how can you possibly do this? Uh, this first guy is just right injection. You, uh, you say, I've got a value. I just want to say it's on in the right in this disjoint union. Multiplication is this thing. If I've got a choice of E or something which is a choice of E or X, then depending on where I am, there are three cases. I can produce an element of E or I can produce an element of X. If I'm here, I say I stay in the left. So this is a choice of in left and in right in Haskell, either in it. If I'm here, uh, then I say, well, again, uh, if I'm on the left, I go to the left. If I'm on the right, I go to the right. Really, I do nothing. If, in this case, I just do identity. So what this signifies is when you've got a computation of computations, then it amounts to first making a choice whether to raise an exception or return a value. But here the value is an inner computation. The inner computation, again, raises an exception or returns a value. I can see it as one simple computation after sequencing, which just says, well, either some exception was returned, it either came from the first computation or the second, or a normal value was returned. And, and, and this is it, nothing else is happening. Inner is inject right, inner is inject left. That's, that's um, loose information, because we don't know where the, 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 on the RHS have we lost information because we don't know where the exception has come from. Exactly, this information is lost now. Yes, okay. that, that, that's entirely true. So this is the abstraction level here. You can do something more. You can, you, can, you can work with more complicated monads that kind of log every little step that you, uh, right, that you right. make on your way. Then you could in principle collect the information uh, about such things. Here, this is not happening. And, uh, and this monad as such is not good for collecting this information, but you can invent something else that would do. Uh, is that the state monad? A state monad in Haskell? Would... No, that's the exceptions monad in Haskell. And no, I think to, that's to, now... No, to say, keep all the information, to not lose... Um, to not, well, lose. to do this, you would... Uh, yes. Uh, uh, you don't need to go to the general... I mean, you can do some, some combination of state and exception, but you can also write a dedicated monad that, that sort of keeps track uh, of on what level, if you wish, on your computation, the exception was, was raised. I it's a different question of how useful it is or why you would do it, but you can, in principle, easily count up such a thing. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Um, Um, let me show you some Haskell um, as well. Um, so it's uh, less abstract. So in Haskell, um, you do monads, not in this way, but in a slightly different way. And actually, I want to show two, uh, both ways, the Haskell way and this sort of standard theory way, so that uh, we can then compare and you understand where the differences and, and similarities are. If that's you, but if anything, we are still seeing the slide and yeah, yeah I'm I'm part. I'm arranging it to reshare so that you see everything at once. Um, now you should see more, um, right? So you see my slide with um, with the definition of what a monad is, but here is a bit of Haskell. Here I'm actually doing uh, monads from scratch and not the Haskell way, but I compare to how they are done in Haskell way. So um, um, these category theory-like monads, I'm calling the type class MND, MND, and the Haskell ones I call monad. Um, T is a monad when it's a functor, that's this bit, if you know Haskell syntax. And it comes with two polymorphic functions, unit that goes from x to tx, and mult that goes from t of t of x to tx. Also sometimes called join, when people have invented other names. Right. Uh, and I can code up, for example, uh, uh, this exceptions monad uh, like this, um, which is exactly this example here. Uh, so uh, t of x is e plus x. So in Haskell, I can say either e is the monad. Yeah, 
unit applied to X injects on the right. That's in R. Multiplication has to make a case distinction depending on whether I'm on the left or on the right. If I'm on the left, and exception, which means exception is raised, then at the end of the day, the summary is also an exception was raised actually in the outer computation. If, if I'm on the right, which means I have some inner computation, uh, and I always write C for computations here and X for values as kind of a mnemonic, then actually the flattened down computation is just this computation, which in turn is a choice between you know, raising the exception or returning a normal value, but I don't need to do any sort of pattern matching and an analysis of this. It's just already has the right type. Does everybody agree with this? Uh, if you've seen Haskell before? No, the annoying thing is you will see your... Um... Yes, um, uh, Will Smith makes a point. <laughs> which is true about category theory here. I, I, I write these things often like with, with, with little diagrams. I, I define compositions of functions, but very often you don't even need to write, look very much at, at what I write on top of the arrows because very often there is only one right thing that you can do. Or maybe there is multiple things that you can do, but there is a canonical thing that you can do, which is then the only right thing. Somebody asked, what are these like lambda and alpha here? These are all comments. Um, uh, <laughs> well, um, I could code this thing by, by basically using some canonical combinators from monoidal categories. I could, for example, say X is the same, same as a choice between empty and X. And then from empty, I can go to E, which means here I've used the left unitality of my, of my monoidal category given by coproduct and empty. And here I've done some case distinction and I've used the canonical map from zero to E. And here I'm somehow using associativity, but it doesn't really matter. Well, everything that's gray is comments. Uh, this is the important bit that is in black. Okay. Now, an alternative is something else. Um, and it's closely triples. It's good for two reasons. It's good um, because um, it is the one that, we're, uh, we, that we know from Haskell, but there are also serious reasons why it's good, sort of on concrete examples, namely, in Kleisley triples or Haskell style monads, there is less data. I mean, here it doesn't seem that there aren't too many data either. I mean, after all, this <laughs> guy has to preserve identity and composition. So here's two equations hidden. And for a family of functions to be a natural transformation, each of them includes one equation. So altogether, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven equations here. In the case of the other format where we arrive now, there is only three equations. And what we do is slightly different. So in, in, in category speak, people call it Kleisley triples or monads in extension form or no iteration form. If you just run into these words, they don't mean much more than exactly this. And what are the differences? So instead of a functor, you're just given an object mapping. So in the case of sets, you only need to know how to make a set of computations from a set of values. And you don't need to know anything about uh, functions. You don't need to lift functions between X and Y into functions between TX and TY, funnily. That's not part of the basic data. You can extract this information from the rest of the data, but it's not part of the basic data. Then there is a family of maps, eta X from X to TX, indexed by these objects. That's, again, a polymorphic function, but naturality is not required. So here, there is two equations that are not required and one piece of data, namely what T does on maps. Here, there is an equation missing compared to the previous definition. I mean, naturality is missing. And instead of multiplication or, or join, you have something completely different. You've got an operation on maps. This notation here stands for the set of all maps from Y to TX. This, uh, of course, is then the set of all maps from TY to, to TX. So it's, it's an operation between sets of maps. Any map from Y to T of X has to be able I have to be able to promote it to go from TY to TX. And these have to satisfy some conditions, which look something like this. So, so here, for example, 
I'm given a map from y to so the left hand side has the same type as the as the right, and this equation has to hold. And then there are similar things. And most importantly, uh, uh, the, the the following two things are the same. You take take two of these effectful functions, one that goes from z to t y, one that goes from y to t x. I can compose k and l by promoting l. I mean, in, instead of l, I write l star. I can compose k with l star, and then I can promote the whole thing, or I can promote them individually and compose. In either case, I do get a map from t z to t x, and the two have to be the same. These are three equations, and actually they correspond to the three equations in the categorical monad notation. Um, but um, but these are the only equations, and they are also how like you how you know the monad equations in the case of Haskell. Maybe some notation is different. This is often called return. This is often called bind, and it's often written with this notation, right? So. Um, Let's define monads in this extension form, also in Haskell. That is actually something that could come from the prelude of Haskell and would in the old times. But nowadays, there is the applicative class that sits between um, functor and monad. And then the definition is different. So uh, slight, uh, because yeah, you have to subclass from applicative, which I don't want to do here. So that's your eta. It goes from x to tx. And they, this is not quite that, and there is some subtle difference. Uh, so what's happening? Um, here I've got the map, uh, well, maybe one thing that is happening, but that's incidental is that I've swapped the letters, but that of course doesn't matter. So let's, let's keep the letters the same way. <clears throat> In one case, I start with the map from y to tx. Here I also use a function from y to tx. And then I have to produce a map from ty to tx, which is here also kind of happening, but in a carried form. The arguments are in the other order. But here's an important difference. Um, in this definition, there are functions on two levels. There are maps in the category from y to tx and from ty to tx, which are some sort of functions. And then there are functions in sets, which is what this arrow here is about, because that arrow is. It's a function space between two things that are already sets that are no longer objects of C. In Haskell, this is all, um, I don't know, kind of conflated together and you don't see this clearly. And uh, one of the reasons is Haskell's monads are not monads, they are strong monads. And this is something that you also sometimes hear uh, when, um, when the theory of monads is um, I can't think about the breaking now, I'm afraid. Um, um, no, it's okay. It's very unclear why it would happen like this. Mm. Um, okay, um, but what was the moral? So there is two different definitions. Um, they should somehow be related. We haven't yet connected them. One is actually nice from the point of view of category here, I'll tell you. I mean, you can do very nice, easy calculations with pictures, diagrams called diagram chasing. The other one is, is in some sense more practical. It makes actually proofs harder and this diagram chasing doesn't become available, not as easily. Um, and you can move between the two. What is the intuition of this bind? Uh, let me tell you this. Um, so given a map k that goes from y to tx, so this was an, uh, an effectful function that takes values in y to computations of tx, we are sort of promoting it so that sequential composition of effectful functions can work nicely. And you saw it in my initial slides. So uh, sometimes, uh, you know, my middle types didn't uh, fit together in composition, and this is exactly for, for fixing these mismatches. Um, if I've got a function like this, I can promote it into a function 
that already on the input side can work not with values, but with an incoming computation. So a computation of values in Y is then transformed somehow into a computation of values in X. Morally, how does this happen is, uh, is the following. You've got this computation here that sends uh, values of Y into computations over X. For any such, um, uh, now you can do the following. If someone gives you a computation of Y, basically simulate the computation. At the end of the day, it gives you a value in Y. Then from that point on, run this computation. And then at the end of the day, you get the value in X rather, right? So this is the idea of monadic composition or, or bind. So how do we do exceptions as Claisley triple? So the join or multiplication work like this, remember this? So I had to look at two cases, um, or uh, uh, there was a nested case distinction, sorry. Um, in the case of this exception Claisley triple, we still have the Tx is e plus y, but now instead of defining mu, I say, how do I get for any function, from any function from y to e plus x into a function from e plus y to e plus x? And what can I do? <laughs> well, this e plus y here, e signifies an incoming exception already. Well, and this means exception was an exception based on my function. So then I just propagate the exception out, but then I can invent the value from x. In the other case, if the incoming value or if the incoming computation is a normal value, then I can just apply the given the given thing, right? Um, Professor, could you repeat the sentence again because your voice was breaking earlier? The, the, the very last sentence is, yes, okay. So this was the definition of multiplication you saw before. Here, we have to be able to transform functions like this into functions like this. Uh, and what is, the what is the difference between two functions? One uses y as the input, the other one uses e plus y as the input. So there is the possibility that, um, uh, that the previous computation that I'm sort of sequencing with, or, or yeah, that I'm appending my computation to already raised an exception, then that exception is propagated out. In the other case, uh, we just behave as k. Mm. Uh, uh, Irene asked, I might have missed it since you said C, X, Y are sets. We are, are we assuming locally small categories? Yes, locally small, not small. Um, uh, you can have um, the Claisley uh, construction for other categories, but then you just have to use a slightly more careful language. Here I boldly said these are sets and for locally small categories, they are. Uh, in the general case, you, you just have to, um, you know, you have to just say these two are collections um, or classes of maps, and you, you have to pretend that you know what it means to map between classes of maps, but that's fine. Yeah. But you cannot officially say that you work in the category of sets then. Um, uh, when you can do things uh, properly to... to, to, to uh, that's important uh, for the whole course. Um, so given so monads and Claisley triples are the same. What are they same for? They are the same for shared object mapping. So T, if T go, takes um, objects to objects, then in the case of monad, I also have to say what it does on maps. In a Claisley triple, I don't have to. And eta, we also share, this is this family of maps that we call the unit. So monads and Claisley triples with the same underlying T and eta are in a bijection. So how do you map between the data? So if you've given a monad, so you have the multiplication, how do you make the, how do you make the Claisley extension out of it? Well, I'm given a map that takes Y to TX. Now I have to make one that takes TY to TX. How can I possibly do this? In the case of a monad in the categorical sense, T is a functor. So if I've got a map from Y to TX, I also have a map from TY to 
TTX, that's called TK, that's the first part. Now I'm in T of TX, but then I've got my multiplication, which I can use at X, and then I'm at TX, and that's what I need. This is conversion in one direction. Then uh, a, how, how do you go in the other direction? Turn a Kleisley triple into a monad. That goes like this. First, I have to define um, what T does on maps. So for any map Y to X, I need one from TY to TX. How do I make one? Well, the only way that I have for this in a Kleisley triple is to promote something that goes from Y to TX or to Kleisley extend something that goes from Y to TX. Something that sends a computation to a computation. Mu. I need something that goes uh, from T of T of X to TX. Um, all I need to do is to take this map identity on T of X, which is from T of X to T of X, and to extend it. And this will put an, an extra T on the left, and I do get my mu. And then you, I mean, the basic fact is these two give you a bijection between monads and Kleisley triples. The equations of one guarantee you the equations of the other and the other way around. There is actually sort of what makes it to work is, is really the following thing. Um, Forget about the equation by general categorical nonsense. <laughs> there is a bijection between maps with this type and then um, maps between sets of maps like this, naturally in Y. This phenomenon is called the Yoneda lemma. And if you look at the line above here, that's the type of multiplication at X. And if you look at the line below here, um, that's the type of the Kleisley extension for different X and Y. But there is a bit more going on because, of course, also you have to check the, uh, uh, the, uh, the equations. Now, what is happening in Haskell? What is happening in Haskell is that you have got this, what I've, which is what I just showed to you as well. The, this officially formalizes not Kleisley triples, but strong Kleisley triples. And the difference is that instead of his maps, we actually have everything coming inside every story So you have a have in Haskell. So double arrows are exponentials in the sense of category theory or just function spaces intuitively. And I go between this object and this object, and it's a map in C. So the type looks kind of similar, but things happen at different levels, right? Here, everything is in C. Here, I'm sending maps of C to maps of C, but this sending happens in set. Um, okay. Now, why in the case of Haskell, we always keep talking about monads rather than maybe always emphasizing strong monads is there is a categorical fact that in categories with unique strength like set, Strong functors and monads are the same as functors and monads. So because strengths are unique, every functor is uniquely strong, you do not notice that this is going on. And therefore, you can freely exchange between these two formats. But really, in more general categories, there is a difference. Now, depending on your background, this might or might not be important to you at all. But it's kind of important to keep in mind if if, if you're on the theory side, because that really affects uh, so many things. Now in Haskell, you do your exceptions monad like this. There is a story about monad in Haskell. It has changed over the history of Haskell. Since CHC 7.10, monad is a subclass of applicative, which in turn is a subclass of functor. It is kind of okay uh, for Haskell specific reasons, a bit because it's true that this kind of uh, hierarchy works where everything to me is strong. So, every uh, uh, but in the, in the general case, this is just plain wrong. Uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, a non-strong monad is not necessarily a, a non-strong uh, applicative. So only strong monads are canonically strong applicatives, but it's also problematic actually for software engineering, I must say, because you have to make a type transformer an instance of functor and applicative before monad, but we know that in the Kleisley form, none of this is needed. You can just write the two basic data return and bind and you're already good. Moreover, um, the, the big conceptual problem is you, may, you have these functors whose natural applicative structure is not the same as the natural monad structure. But if you use this subclassing and you want to you know, give your functor a particular monad structure, then what applicative structure you give the same functor is, is dictated to you and it need not be what you actually want, which is kind of annoying. Of course, you can get around it by sort of creating clones of data types. And then you get extra layers of data constructors to, to distinguish between them, etc. But this is in some sense really um, unfortunate. Well, in defense uh, of Pascal, I would say that uh, you can uh, actually can, uh, use from the standard use library the uh, default uh, drop ins for the definitions from, from class for functor and applicative, which are based on uh, methods uh, from monad. So monad. it's a non issue, I think. Um, but it's still an issue okay uh, excuse me you are breaking so we didn't hear you so Let me try to change the network. Uh, uh, professor, could you try from this different could you try, Professor, could you try to disable your video? It might help. Somebody suggested to cut his own video, not the screen share. I can uh, cut the video, but I'm not sure if it's any useful. He, uh, it, he, it reduces the amount of bandwidth required to go out. I know, but. Um, it might help. We don't know. Oh, this is so wrong. I should be at, at very good bandwidth. There is something else that is wrong. Okay. Let me just try a thing for. So now I'm on a different network. Is it any different? Uh, now it's clear. I mean, there was no breaking of your, breaking of your, breaking of your voice. Sounds good so far. Okay, let's try. Um, um, so a, a fundamental thing about monads is that they define something um, that are called Kleisley categories. And this is actually the place where your impure functions live. So I have to give you the definition. And it is, it is really it is really intuitive. So if you've got a monad on a category, it gives you another category. And the thinking is your base category is where your pure functions live. And if you want to work there with composition of impure functions, then you always have to think about this extra data type of computations that you, uh, that you work with. In this other category called Kleisley T, this is kind of hidden. So what is happening there? Uh, Kleisley T has exactly the same object as C. So an object of Kleisley T is an object of C, full stop. What are the maps there? A map there from Y to X, a morally then functions in there, is the same as a map in the base category from y to t of x. So what you consider to be a function in Kleisley t is actually what under the hood are functions from y to t of x. And now think t of x is maybe e plus x or list x from my examples. Now, what is the identity? Identity has to go between, pardon? 
Uh, so, I mean, the whole idea in Haskell of introducing the uh, monads is that you want to take care of the environment, right? I.O. I.O. So, uh, um, the not only the that. environment no. plus... But... Okay. No, let, let, let me carry on with my story and I'll explain how, how it fits there. I mean, uh, it's, it's a bit more. Uh, so, uh, uh, what is the identity in this category? It has to be a map between X and X, but maps between X and X are just maps between X and TX, so I can use the unit. What is the composition here? A composition, which I then denote here with like a, a circle T for, for compositioning Kleisley, it has to take two Kleisley maps between S, Z, and Y, and Y and X, and compose them together into maps between Z and X. I also use the little superscript here just to indicate these are maps in the Kleisley category. And then how is this done? In terms of the base category, I need to go from Z to TX. And the way that I can do it, I can talk, think about it in two ways. I first use K, and then I use the promoted version of L. Or if I think in terms of multiplication, I just first use functoriality of T on L, and then I compose with multiplication. So these two ways are really the same thing, according to this correspondence between monads and Kleisen triples. And then this base category C is included in the Kleisen category um, by a functor that sends objects to objects, its identity on objects, uh, uh, sends objects to the same objects, its identity on objects. But what it do, does on maps is it takes any pure function, any map in the base category, and it views it as a map in the Kleisley category by sort of bureaucratically interpreting the pure function as trivially impure. So the intuition then is the base category is types and pure functions. The Kleisley category is types and impure functions. Instead of returning a value of a return type of interest, they return a computation of values. And then the functor between the two takes a function into a trivially impure function. Let's now look at some more examples uh, because I'm really annoyed that this, uh, this connectivity has basically killed this lecture. I wanted to go quickly through reader, writer, uh, state, and then also actually continuations and free monads, but we can do this tomorrow, uh, but, but at least some examples. Suppose my category is Cartesian closed. This just means that it at least has products and function spaces. Then you de can define the reader monad. Uh, and for a given x, t of x is functions from s to x. This is the internal function space of the category. S you think of as uh, here the set or type of readable states or data values from a state, you could say. And then what's the game of this sort of trivial computations and flattening of computations? If you've got a... Uh, a computation here is really something that reads and render returns, nothing else. Uh, and if a computation is multiple reads, then we, can uh, then we can flatten it into a single read because surely, um, or we, 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 we can simplify uh, you know, a sequence of read actions into a single one because we don't have to uh, record every single read step we did. We know that all of these functional dependencies give us exactly the same value if, uh, if we're reading from a from a reliable source. So computations are just dependencies of values on, on the state. So functions from state to values. If you want to view a value as a computation trivially, then it's the uh, constant that value function. So eta of x, return of x is just lambda sx. If you've got a computation of computations, then you can sequence it together into a single computation. And that's the most important bit. So F here is a computation that first reads and then returns a thing that's again a computation that reads and then returns. Um, I can view it as a simple computation, as one single computation of values by saying, well, what is this? I take a state and then I just behave as F does. When F first asks for an argument, I provide S, and when it's asked for an argument for the second time, I also provide S as well. So basically apply F to the diagonal, so to say. So that's a nice monad. And of course, you can also implement it in, uh, in Haskell, no doubt. So this is exact the same definition here. Um, then there are writer monads. Uh, these are for, um, for output. 
uh, you can morally think that you, you you print something out and all, everything you print out is, con uh, is is concatenated together. But more generally, uh, a writer monad is given by any fixed monoid object. So there is an object P and an element uh, or set or type P and an element and a binary operation. You think of the elements here as updates, so maybe like strings you, you, you want to add to already existing output. Trivial update, which means you, up, you, you add nothing, and composition of updates, which is like concatenate two, two right actions. So uh, uh, in, instead of printing just two strings, you're printing one. Then what is this? These are your computations. T of x is p times x. The unit. It takes a value and it turns it into a trivial computation, purely bureaucratically. So if you've got a value and you just want to only talk about this value purely functionally, nothing is printed. So you use the unit of the monoid. Uh, um, mu has to take a computation of computation. So P times P times X and apply this sequencing to it. So you get one single computation. And here, what you need to do is to use the, uh, the binary operation of the monoid. Right? The most typical examples are like you say, P is maybe strings, that's the empty string and concatenation, or more generally, like lists over some, uh, some fixed set and the empty list and concatenation. If the fixed set is just a singleton, this actually reduces to natural numbers, zero and plus, or like natural numbers in the unary. Um, and maybe this is how much I want to say now. Um, there is state monads. Um, and this is the definition. T of x, computations over x are what? Um, you can think about state very intentionally saying like state manipulation is some reads followed by some writes, followed by some reads, followed by some writes at the end of the day, return something. But here we view state extensionally. So stateful computation seen from the outside it needs the initial state uh, to actually do anything. And at the end, it will produce some final state. And there may be all the intermediate uh, reads and writes, but they don't somehow matter in the sense that uh, you can reduce them all to the initial read and the final write. So T of X is then this. If you wonder where the parentheses are, they are here. Uh, so time spines tighter than uh, arrows. Uh, eta takes a value and turns it into a stateful computation basically by saying, okay, if you want that I read the state, then I do read, then I return back the same state, but, but, but the return value is X. So really it's a bureaucratic form of, of basically just only saying we had this value <laughs> in this framework. Mu has a computation of computations and flattens it uh, to a single computation basically by threading through state. So I have to manufacture this thing, which is a function taking a little s, and then I have to produce another little s and the next. How do I do this? I take my little s, I apply my function f, that one, to it. This gives me a pair of s prime, which I have to think of like a middle state, and the new function. To that new function, I, produce, uh, I provide the middle state, and then I get back a pair of a uh, final state and the value on these other ones that I actually return. Lists, uh, and that should be the, really the final one for today, because now we ran out of time because of all this disaster, is, um, is, is a very often used uh, monad. But I have to say, <laughs> there is something funny about the name, because uh, when, when you talk about the list monad, you, you, you have in mind uh, a particular monad structure on the list functor, but actually there are many more other Mono structures on the list functor, but there is one canonical one we have in mind. And the exotic ones also make sense, and they also model some forms of non-determinism, but not just the usual one. So let's first work with the ordinary list monad. Uh, a list monad is kind of for a notion of non-deterministic computation, where the little binary choices that you make along the way are not recorded, uh, but the, the sort of final uh, list of outcomes is remembered. Also, sort of the left to right order is remembered in the sense that, you know, if I made a choice to go to the left or to the right and then further to the left or to the right, 
maybe I got three outcomes, but they now come in a certain order, which is the left to right traversal order of the, of the, of the tree of choices. This is the monad. How do you see a value as a list of values? Well, there is one reasonable way, namely a singleton list. When you've got a list of X, a list of lists, which I signify here by this mnemonic X is, then you can concatenate this list of lists together and you get a list. Uh, I mean, here I'm using the Haskell notation. But this is not the only list monad. You could, you could easily do other things. So for example, you could still say the unit gives you the um, singleton list. But if you've got a list of lists, then you don't concatenate them uh, always. You first check if any of the inner list is empty. And if that's the case, then actually the whole result will be empty. If none of the inner lists in your list of lists are empty, then you concatenate them together. And I invite you to check that this, you know, meets the quality criteria of the, mo of the monad. It satisfies the laws. And then there are many other ones. And uh, in the Haskell code that I provide, I, I show some. There is also a pointer to a place where you can see many more. Um, these are also here in the code. So I define what the monoid is, uh, which is actually according to the Haskell names for these things. The monoid unit is called empty and the uh, multiplication is called append. There is the state monad in this format. Um, um, there are other things that I haven't covered yet. Uh, somewhere there are the list monads further down uh, in this file. And then you can convert between these things. So if I've got a thing that is an instance of monads in the categorical sense, I can make a monad in sort of the standard Haskell sense. The return is the unit and the bind is defined in terms of multiplication and the, and the uh, uh, map mapping part of the functor called fmap in Haskell. This all works nicely. And you can also start at the other end, actually. I also provide a file where you start with a Haskell formulation and then produce the categorical uh, uh, formulation from there. So it really depends on which way around you want to make the subclass. Um, but it's not deep. Uh, I wanted to cover a bit more, but it's, uh, it's not the worst. But if the quality of the video is very bad, then, uh, then this, is, this is unfortunate. Uh, the, um, the, the some questions and then I stop. Um, um, is the writer thing a bit like a history? Yes, very much like this. So if you just want to log stuff, um, you can. Uh, you don't need state for this. State both reads and writes. So a writer logs. Uh, and it logs in, uh, actually in that sense that the state always overwrites uh, what, whatever was there. I mean, the updates here are completely destructive. Uh, in a writer, you can never, uh, you can never delete things uh, if your monoid here is free. Like in the case of lists, you will see the whole history. If instead of lists here, you work with something where the multiplication, uh, 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 forgets information, then, yeah, of course, um, um, you lose you lose uh, information about the history. So different things are possible here, and you, you can look at other examples. Um, was there something more? Um, uh, please put you in, in my slide somewhere so that you can review tonight. Yes, I will. I, I will also put the code. I also some, have some exercises you could you could you could want to tinker with. Uh, I, I give the link to um, to uh, to Jim and um, and the other organizers, but I can also give the link here right away. Uh, I think the material will be copied uh, also to um, uh, to the school school web page. But I may update a few things dynamically depending on how questions are asked and I might complete the, uh, the slides to, to, to answer the questions. So currently you'll see my slides there and, and the two files um, with Haskell code, um, which doesn't, con oh, I mean, which has some very standard stuff, but then there is, then there are, then there is some extras that are like comparisons between more intentional and more extensional versions of, 
of, of, of the state monad, for example, which I want to comment on in the lecture. So uh, if you don't, I mean, the, 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 the Haskell code obviously is not self-explanatory, it's somewhat commented, but I'll, I'll comment it in detail. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll also put some exercises in, in the very same directive. Uh, 